Hey, thanks for joining me for a little scriptural exploration. We're going to look at the uh, readings for Corpus Christi Sunday. So readings very much about the Eucharist. Excited because I think sometimes, Catholics especially, sometimes we forget how deeply biblical the doctrine of uh, Jesus' real presence in the Eucharist truly is. And that's what we have a chance to take a look at now. So let's uh, ask God to bless us. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the mystery not only of the word, your word to us in the written scriptures, but the word made flesh in the most holy Eucharist. Help us to understand and love this great mystery through our encounter with the scriptural word today. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. So our readings here for Corpus Christi are Deuteronomy 8, uh, 2 and following, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 and 17. I want to look at those two and actually how they go together, because that's actually sort of rare when the first reading and the second reading link up and mutually illuminate each other so much. And then we'll look uh, briefly at the gospel, maybe the most famous uh, teaching of Jesus on his, the real, his real presence in the Eucharist in John chapter 6, verse 51 and following. Let me read to you here from Deuteronomy 8. Moses said to the people, Remember how for 40 years now the Lord your God has directed all your journeying in the desert, so as to test you by affliction, and find out whether or not it was your intention to keep his commandments. He therefore let you be afflicted with hunger, and then fed you with manna, a food unknown to you and your fathers, in order to show you that not by bread alone does one live, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of the Lord. Do not forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to that place of slavery, who guided you through the vast and terrible desert, with its seraph serpents and scorpions, its parched and waterless ground, who brought forth water for you from the flinty rock and fed you in the desert with manna, a food unknown to your fathers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So that is the reading from Deuteronomy 8, in which Moses is reminding the people before they enter into the promised land of God's faithfulness to them in the Exodus wanderings in the 40 years through the desert. Now, this is at the end of the 40 years before Moses hands off the people to Joshua, who will then lead everyone through the Jordan and finally into the uh, conquest of the promised land. But so clearly here is the manna. Now the manna, if you will recall, was this miraculous bread-like, uh, flaky, wafer-like substance which rained down from heaven, which wasn't made by human hands, but was given by God. And he's, Moses here is reminding the people that God fed them. He allowed them to be afflicted with hunger and then fed them with manna. Why did he afflict them? Well, it was to test them by affliction to find out whether or not it was their intention to keep the commandments. So this bread from heaven is also connected to the faithfulness of the people. The hunger, the physical hunger, is a kind of occasion for their spiritual testing. And the manna feeds them physically, yes indeed, but it also feeds them spiritually because it is helps them understand and experience that God is with them, that God is faithful. Remember what occasioned the giving of the man in the first place, that they're complaining against God. They think God has led them out into the desert to die, and the manna feed, feeds them. Right off the bat here, what I want to say is that the Eucharist is best understood through Old Testament typologies. A typology is something in the Old Testament which is a foreshadowing of what God will do in the New Testament. The, um, that word foreshadow, I think, is helpful because when you look at a shadow, what you see are the basic outlines of what, some, of what something is. And those foreshadowings are important because they provide a kind of preemptive preparation and also illumination for the New Testament fulfillment. What's really helpful, then, is to understand that the, that the Eucharist is foreshadowed by the manna in the desert. What God will give in the New Testament is going to fulfill what's in the Old. 
key line, key point here to remember is that because we're dealing with the Old Testament foreshadowings, in this case, the manna from heaven, that there's going to be a kind of bread that God feeds his people with, which will be connected to not just uh, physical eating, but also spiritual hunger related to faithfulness and fidelity, trust in God. That the New Testament fulfillment always has to be greater than the Old Testament. The church fathers understood this really, really well. You can't have a New Testament fulfillment, which is some less than the Old Testament foreshadowing. Why? Because why would be the purpose of the of the teaching or the preparation? For example, Christ is the new Adam, therefore he has to be greater than the old Adam. G Jesus is the new David, he has to be greater than the old David. Uh, Jesus is the Lamb of God, so he has to be greater than the uh, original Passover lambs, etc. So that's true here of the man in the desert. I say that right off the bat uh, because um, it, in the last 500 years or so, especially with some of our Protestant brothers and sisters, there's been, a t I think, a, a theological tendency to not see that the New Testament uh, manna that Jesus gives at the Last Supper is, in fact, greater than the Old Testament foreshadowing. What do I mean? Uh, check out that last line of uh, Deuteronomy 8 that... Um, the manna is a food unknown to your fathers. There was a Jewish tradition around the manna that it was the bread of angels. Catholics are familiar, familiar with that because we call the Eucharist panis angelicus, angelic bread. It was the, it was what God, uh, what the angels themselves nourished themselves on uh, in heaven. So it's super. It's a kind of supernatural bread. It's not produced by nature. It's given by God to feed the, his people Israel. It's not made by human hands. There's a supernatural quality to it. That's just the old manna from the Old Testament. So the new manna can't simply be bread made by human hands. It has to be more than, not only more than that, it has to be more than miraculous bread which comes from heaven not made by human hands. And I think just that obvious point right there so often is missed by um, our Protestant brothers and sisters, as I said, who would never say that uh, Jesus is less than the first Adam. Of course not. Or less than King David. He's the son of God. He's, he's um, si perfectly sinless and, um, and eternal in his person <laughs> personhood as the divine son of God. So that um, is the, the ground in which these readings um, start us off with respect to the Eucharist. So the Eucharist in the New Testament is going to be a new manna from heaven, which will be in some way superior to the old manna that was given in the desert. Now let's fast forward to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I want to show how this actually, the scriptures themselves connect these readings. It's no accident that the church chooses 1 Corinthians 10. It's only two verses. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17. Here's St. Paul. Brothers and sisters, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread we, that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because the loaf of bread is one, we, though many, are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So short, and, you know, Paul's not uh, easy. And let's take a, a look at this, maybe just really... Uh, briefly, in context of the whole of the letter to the Corinthians, which if you know anything about the uh, two Corinthians letters, there was this moral problem that was going on with the people in Corinth, which in some, day, some ways was like a modern day Las Vegas, kind of a city of sin. Um, there were various forms of debauchery and idolatry and things going on in the uh, city, which was making it difficult for uh, Christians to live the new covenant and the new law of the gospel. So Paul will begin the letter to the Corinthians speaking about the word of the cross, which is foolishness to Gentiles and a stumbling block to Jews. And the only way to believe that this word, that the Son of God, God himself, redeemed the word by being crucified on a cross is only possible to believe through the power of the Holy Spirit. But that opens the door then to these mysteries and St. Paul will describe himself as a steward of the mysteries along with the other apostles. 
And these mysteries include the church itself, which is a mystical body. It's a, it's a body made up of many parts, which, which also involves the mystery that every Christian who's baptized in the mystery of baptism is in fact the temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul says that I think in chapter four or five of, of Corinthians. And as he builds his argument, I will now speak of marriage as this great uh, sign or, or mystery, this holy mystery, um, as well as the mystery of uh, virginity for the sake of the kingdom. Um, fast forward now up to 10, chapter 10, where we here are now. So that's just the background of where Paul is in these two verses. And he will speak about, guess what, typologies from the Old Testament as he builds up his argument for his teaching on the Eucharist, which actually is coming um, in these next several chapters. He's going to speak about Moses and how, in chapter 10, um, that Moses was he, in, who which, into whom was baptized the people of God. There's a kind of type of being baptized into Christ, into Christ's body. And he says here that they all not only were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, but all ate the same supernatural food and drank the same supernatural drink. For they all drank from the same supernatural rock that, which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Do you understand now what those two verses are that we heard 16 verses later? What do you mean, Paul, that they drank the same supernatural drink and drank, ate the same supernatural food? Well, every Jew would have known. He's talking here about the supernatural food of manna from heaven. And the supernatural drink is the water that flows from the rock that Moses is supposed to speak over. And then this water gushes from them. But Paul here is saying, don't you know what you were actually eating from and drinking from was Christ? How can Paul say that? How can he say that? Because the Son of God is an eternal person, and he's the same God who is leading people through the desert. Was he giving them the Eucharist in the man from heaven? No. Was he giving them the Holy Spirit in the water from the rock? No. But he himself is giving, as God, these types, which in some way, in a foreshadowing way, participate in the New Testament reality by way of foreshadowing, by way of typology. And here Paul is speaking, like bringing the two together. He's bringing the Old Testament foreshadowing and the new, in the light of the New Testament fulfillment together, and it's this explosion of uh, insight. So, oh, I, th I turned the page the wrong uh, direction. So he's going to speak about not um, grumbling against God, not indulging in immorality, not giving into temptation because God is faithful. Right? These are all themes from the. Uh, wanderings in the wilderness, shunning of idols. And then uh, finally, up here on verse 16 and 17, as we heard, that he will say, hey, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? So it's the, the cup from the, the liturgy, from the, the Christian's worship of God. He says, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Not a, a, a vague symbol not a mere um, intellectual calling to mind it, but an actual participation. And the bread we break is not a participation in the blood of Christ. That word participation, it can also be, it can also be uh, translated as communion. Communion. Um, just today we celebrated at the parish the, uh, the confirmation and first holy communion. Or you could call it first, hol first holy participation. That through the Eucharistic uh, chalice and Eucharistic bread, there's a real participation in the um, body of Christ. In Now, what body of Christ? Well, the church puts this feast right here just after Pentecost and after the Ascension and after Easter because it's the risen and ascended body of Christ. And that same one body is also the church. Um, not long after, go to, go to the very next chapter after he speaks about, in the Eucharist in chapter 11, he speaks about the one body of Christ, the one body of Christ in uh, chapter 11. One body, many members. The, to this day, as Catholics, in our theology, we say the Eucharist makes the church, and also the church makes the Eucharist. 
In other words, it's from Christ himself that the Eucharistic gift is given. Only Christ himself can give himself really uh, in an authentic way so that we can partic- so we can do what Paul's talking about here, participate in his, in his blood and his body, in his risen blood, in his as- ascended blood, in his risen body, in his ascended body. Um, but that also helps the church grow. Why? Because the church is Christ's body. Christ here is feeding the members of his body with himself through this sacramental participation. Um, okay, so much more we could say there. But well, what I want you to see at the end of this short little two-verse reading from Paul is this line, because the loaf of bread is one, we though are one body and for all partake of the one loaf. So I I know over here, when you hear that, you might imagine like, like this gigantic loaf of bread, like someone trying to break the Guinness Book of World Records for like largest loaf of bread. I don't know, something like 50 feet tall and, you know, 300 feet long loaf of bread. I don't think that's exactly what Paul has in mind here. He, he has in mind that it's the oneness of Christ. It may be a kind of a mixed uh, analogy um, because a few chapters before, Paul's speaking here about the temple, um, that, that Christ himself, his body is this living temple, and then we're individually parts of it and individually parts of the one uh, body. So it's, it's the oneness of Christ in his mystical body made up of many members which um, we uh, partake in in the, in the Eucharist and allow us uh, to grow. Um, keep, keep in mind, too, what follows this chapter 10 in, on the Eucharist and then chapter um, 11 on the church is, and then not to mention, in, in 11, he goes back to um, the, the Eucharist, where we actually get the words of institution from the Last Supper, and about eating and drinking unworthily unless you, uh, in 11.27, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Um, so again, a deep sacramental realism there. He's not speaking here about mere symbols of, the, of Jesus' body and blood, but of the body and blood of the Lord himself. And then 12 is on the oneness of the, of the church. But then 13 is the kind of interpretive key, I think, of, Everything that Paul has said so far, the Eucharist, the church, the cross, which is love. Now, this reading is read a lot at weddings, which, of course, and that's very um, appropriate because earlier in this whole letter, Paul himself, himself speaks about marriage. But what I want you to see is that it's divine love which interprets everything that's come before. The Eucharist is manna from heaven. It's divine love which provides for us. It's divine love which is that which we are called to trust. It's divine love which unites the church. It's divine love by which Christ gives himself uh, really and truly and substantially in the Holy uh, Eucharist. Much more we can say about the rest of the letter, but I want to focus on on um, what we've already seen there in the Eucharist. Okay, fast forward now to John 6. 51 to 58. And uh, let me read it briefly and just say a word or two about it. Jesus said to the Jewish crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. So here Jesus is transitioning from um, the what he's done before, which is comparing himself to this living bread that came down from heaven, again, the manna from heaven, but then claiming that he himself is living bread that came down from heaven. And in this verse 51, he shifts from belief in him to now the bread being his own flesh, which he will give. And he's going to shift here, not from believing in him as the living bread, but he'll take it one step farther to eating his flesh as a next step after belief in him as the living bread. And what happens next, you can quite understand well, I think, the Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That would be repugnant, not only just to human custom and reason in general, but Jews in in particular had a, a legal prohibition against the eating of animal flesh with its blood in it and the eating and drinking of human flesh. The, the, the blood and is where the life of something is. That's why you can't eat 
an animal's flesh with blood in it because you're sort of taking an animal life into your, yourself, which is beneath human dignity. But of course, eating and drinking of human f of flesh is uh, particularly re repugnant for obvious reasons. And that's how they understand him. It's a kind of cannibalistic interpretation. How can he give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus says to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. You can spend a lifetime meditating on that. And I'll tell you, for me personally, these words, when I discovered them as a high school student, they absolutely uh, changed my life. In fact, I, I, they, they so impacted me in terms of the, this, the, the divine love in the heart of Christ for us and for me, so impacted me that I, I took a quote from here and put it in my senior picture in my high school. Anyway, first thing to point out here is that it's it begins and ends this, um, what, eight verse section with manna from heaven as a basic typology. So for Jesus himself, the manna from heaven is um, a key interpretive lens for the Eucharist. Secondly, Jesus doesn't downplay the reality of his body and blood. In fact, he intensifies it. He doesn't retreat into a mere symbolic interpretation, but intensifies it, repeating again and again about eating his flesh, drinking his blood. This is not, this is true food. This is true drink. And unless you eat it and drink it, you'll have no life in you. So it's, you know, you, you've probably heard many Catholic teachers highlight this, I think, obvious point that Jesus is a great teacher who when people misunderstand his parables or his symbols, He'll help them back off and, and understand, no, here's the point. I don't literally mean this. I don't literally mean that. This is a symbol for X. This is a symbol for Y. But here he doesn't do that. So it should catch our attention. He actually intensifies the literal meaning of the words. He shifts his a word, for example, from the, um, the Greek word um, uh, to eat, which simply means like eat like any human being, to a more literalistic word like nunch, munch, or gnaw, chew on, the way animals eat. He, he intensifies the literal interpretation here as he moves forward. But uh, thirdly, what I want you to see, though, is that this is not cannibalism or something. Why? Because Jesus connects this real eating and real drinking and his real, it's really his body, it's really his blood, but this eating and drinking will be analogous to his relationship to the Father. So the relationship of his disciples to the eating and drinking of his body and blood will somehow be analogous or parallel to his relationship to the Father. Just as the living Father sent me and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. And that is possible only if the Eucharist is not merely cannibalism, but a kind of communion with Jesus' body and blood in such a way that his body and blood can convey divine life. That's precisely what we believe because what's, what Catholics have always believed is given in the Eucharist is not like a piece of Jesus or something like that. But the whole Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, that's, that's just another way of saying it's Christ himself. But that includes, that means it's Christ post-resurrection, post-ascension. It's his glorified humanity, which can be given now in this extraordinary way, which frankly, infinitely goes beyond our human imagination and capacity to understand, but nonetheless is not irrational because it's participating in the power of his ascension. In fact, if you go to the scriptures here after uh, verse 67 and following, Jesus will speak about, guess what? the ascension and the Holy Spirit. It's the spirit that gives life, not the flesh. He's not downplaying the literal interpretation of his body and blood, but he wants us to see that his body and blood is now, will be given through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we know now, um, ascended at, from the ascended Christ. I think that keeps us from getting like a weird interpretation, like 
Have you ever come across someone who says, like, I shouldn't chew the blessed sacrament because I don't want to hurt Jesus? Well, that's ridiculous. Because he's ascended into heaven, and the mode of his presence here um, is uh, unique because it's sacramental. That doesn't mean not real. It means under the appearance of bread and wine in a sacramental way. But it's also glorified and, cap and capable of giving us life. Just as the Father receives life, just as the Son receives life from the Father, that's in, in his eternal identity as Son, he's always being begotten by the Father. So through the grace of the Eucharist, Jesus is setting up that same relationship to us. He wants us to receive life from him. And we have bodies and senses, not just souls. And so the Eucharist pertains to our own humanity and yet feeds us supernaturally. Our patron Thomas Aquinas said, Sacramenta propter homines, that's his Latin for the sacraments, are fitting for human beings. Why? Because they give us grace, um, divine life, which is what we're created for in our, in our spiritual nature. But in our corporal nature, we have senses and bodies, and, and we eat and drink. And so that's why Thomas loved this image, that this truth that the sacraments are proper to us that uh, God gives us divine life, above all in the Eucharist, but he does it through our senses. What we cannot see, Christ's uh, ascended and glorified body, blood, and soul, and divinity, and nonetheless is given to us really, truly, and substantially in the Eucharist, which is visible only to the eyes of faith. And of course, that's what Paul was talking about when he says, don't you know we're participating in the body and blood of the Lord? Um... This is the central mystery of our faith, and I feel like every time I ever get a chance to explore the scriptures, it's just uh, thrilling. Uh, let me end with, with this thought. There's a principle in scriptural studies, um, which is called the, which historical uh, critics of the a Bible will use to try to verify if something was hi like historically accurate or really happened. And one of, and when that criterion is called the criterion of embarrassment, which is, if, if something could have been embarrassing to an original author, he probably wouldn't have written it unless it was really true. I think this is, can be well applied to the church's unbroken doctrine of the real presence of the Eucharist. That the Eucharist is truly Christ's body and blood. We really eat and drink his body and blood. Not in a cannibalistic way, but in a sacramental way, which is a participation in his divine life. And that's how it's greater than the manna in the desert that our forefathers in Israel ate. That's how it's greater. It's not simply the bread of angels. It's God himself. Now, that's, that would be an, that's an embarrassing claim in the sense of it's so great um, that, that God himself would give himself to us. Even in the first centuries of the church, Christians were accused by, like, Romans of being cannibals. Why would you inflict that on yourself? You, why would you just make that up? And even to this day, the church strongly holds the true presence of Christ, even when a lot of Catholics don't claim to believe it. And when, you know, you could see, you could see how that would make us easily mocked. Oh, you believe that you're actually, like, eating God or you're, you're chewing on Jesus or, or these... Um, unnuanced or unsophisticated interpretations which can be leveled against us as a kind of way to mock us. Maybe you yourself have felt it. You go to Holy Communion and like you feel like you're eating a wafer. You feel like you're taking a little sip of, of wine and you think, God, dude, really? Is this really the, the body of Christ? Is this really the Son of God giving himself to me as my supernatural food? It doesn't feel like it, taste like it, seem like it. Um, there's a kind of embarrassment to that. Um, it's, it seems to our senses to, so be, it, to be so underwhelming when you compare it to the reality that the church claims it to be, that Paul claims it to be as the new manna, that Christ himself claims it to be as his body and blood, as the true bread come down from heaven. Um, it can be a, a kind of source of embarrassment, um, easily mocked. And yet, I think because of the criterion of embarrassment, because it was there from the very beginning, and that's what these scriptures are showing us, it's a sign that it was believed as such from the very beginning. It's not a later invention of, say, uh, medieval scholastics, even as so many of the medievals loved the Eucharist and loved to open up its theological and philosophical uh, meanings.
So I think it can be a, that can encourage us to really put our faith in the mystery of faith, which is Christ's uh, true presence in the Eucharist, the true manna come down from heaven, which uh, nourishes our faith and unites us to the true ascended and glorified body of Christ. And in doing so, unites us to, to the whole body of Christ on earth. Anyway, thanks for spending some time with me. I wish you a very blessed Corpus Christi feast day. And may these uh, readings and this time together deepen our love and faith in the Holy Eucharist. God bless you, everybody. Thanks for spending some time with me.